reason when I rise I can't have my freedom when I rise There ain't nothing in the morning That comes as a surprise And I don't want no reason when I rise I rise whoa I go to work in the morning when I rise oh will I ever get away from prison time Well, it's four long years of living here and nobody to shed a tear and that's just one less reason now to rise, to rise, oh. It won't make much difference when I leave When a heart is stone locked up, there is no breeze. And freedom's just a rusty word that somehow meant to tease. Will I ever feel another summer breeze? Oh. Well, I wish I had a reason now to die. I haven't got the salt for tears to cry. I am a stone that was a bird. Oh, will I ever fly? And when I get there, My freedom will I cry, oh Lord, will I cry? Mm -hmm. I don't want no reason when I rise. I can't have my freedom when I rise. Nothing in the morning that comes as a surprise And that's just one less reason now to rise, to rise, whoa This film was made by women inside and women outside, working together. Every Sunday for six months, we met in a classroom of the prison, where we planned the film and photographed it on videotape. Everyone operated the camera, and the songs were written, performed, and recorded by women inside. About two years ago, I was on felony probation for uh, forging checks. And uh, I had an offer for a job working for Crescent Jewelers in the executive offices, working uh, it's more like a receptionist to the president. And uh, in order to get this job, I had to have a $25,000 bond, and my probation officer had to sign. Okay, I had letters from the president the executive secretary was behind me she's the one that was trying to get me the job the job was about nine hundred dollars a month that's not take home but net pay and uh, so i got a bondsman said that he would back the bond for me but i still had to have my probation officer's signature 
So I went to her and I asked her, would you please sign for me? And she told me a flat no. And I asked her the reason why. And she told me that a person of my caliber did not deserve a high paying job like that. Okay, two weeks later I was arrested again for forgery because I wasn't qualified for welfare and I have two children and they come before anything and I had to feed them some kind of way. You know, most of the black women, the majority of the black women in here come from, you know, the ghetto. You know, the pride of a lot of education, you know, being, you know, being aware of what's going on in society, you know. So, and when you go to the judge, uh, the majority of the judges are white. And if you try by a jury like I was, your peers, they're white, you know. So, you know, deep inside you have a lot of guilt, you know, grudges, you know, against regardless, even if, you know, I have quite a few white friends, you know, but even they're just so far that they can go. I can see that it, it's, I think, a romantic attraction to substitute a heroin problem for a, any other problem. But what problems could you have? You're not ugly and sick and well, okay, well I think, it, I think like the environment and my family life, you know, I was really um, rejected the black sheep, you know, one of the inside things. And I never had that communication with my family, and I had guilt feelings about that, and I felt that I needed to make up for them. And then, then finally I said, well, just fuck it, I'll just get loaded. A junkie doesn't care if you say drop dead, they say, hey, fuck you, you know, you drop dead, because I don't care. And I don't care if they say fuck you, you know, because that's all I care about is that getting that bag, man. That's it. That wraps it. That's your world. This is it. You know? And when all of a yeah. sudden, when all you can think about is scoring, copying from the man, and getting your connection, then you don't care if Nixon's fucking up, and you don't care what's happening in China. You don't care. When, when they put me on probation, and when I was in jail for three days, I realized how much I had been using these pills. So I quit taking the pills, and I was just going to take them once in a while. Um, but that didn't work because my probation officer drops in and, you know, gives me a test every now and then. So I decided, well, I really don't need them at all, you know. But I want to go back to college and I want to learn to do this and I want to learn to do this. And I, I made up my own mind and I decided it was time for me to do it. And I, could, I knew where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do, but I didn't know how to do it. And I thought that was part of what probation would do, you know. They said, we're giving you this chance, you know. And I thought, instead of just putting me on a leash, they were going to help me, direct me. That's what my probation officer led me to feel. So I talked to him about it, and he gave me these places to go. Then I went to the vocational rehabilitation, and after talking with them, I felt like, well, I really don't have a problem or they can't worry about me because they have too many people with heavier problems. Because I had never been addicted to heroin. I had never been incarcerated for being addicted to heroin. Or like I had never been committed to a hospital for withdrawals. Or I had never gone to jail, to prison, or to a program like CRC. And they just, they didn't have enough funds. They had to deal with just the parolees because they didn't want to send them back to the institutions. They wanted to help them in society. And they couldn't do anything for me because I'd never been incarcerated. Now I've been incarcerated, so maybe now I can get some help. They don't, they don't have anything set up for, for narcotics. Oh, for anything, you know. Then it's, you know, Sometimes you stop and think, well, what can they really set up? You know, I mean, what, what does the institution really know about these people except to lock you, you know, to isolate you, you know, to isolate you from society? I know three or four women that have used drugs have turned out to heroin since they've been in this institution. And they never used heroin in the streets because they could see what it was doing to their friends and neighbors and relatives in, in the streets, what the heroin did to them. <clears throat> but 
Since they've been here, they have used because they feel the need to escape, and they only use it for an escape. I used to take 15 to 20 volume in one wax, so I know I've got the... I can't take no pills, not without taking a bunch of them. One of the only reasons that they're giving you pills now is because the institution doesn't want to cope with how you act not being on those pills. Right. Right. There's one psychiatrist in this institution who does not have time to see you because he's busy doing board reports. So he prescribes the drugs. He's got a good working knowledge of what medication makes people sit down and shut up. <laughs> well, I take drugs to keep myself pacified. When I first came in, I was just going up the wall with between you know, hostility and uh, sexual frustration. I was ready to do somebody in, and I don't, I don't feel those feelings quite as intensely now that I'm on them. And I would much rather have the drugs cope with my problem, those particular problems and have to face them every day that I was in here. It makes it a little bit easier. I sometimes think it's a coward's way out, but I'm willing to accept it. coming in to check on the facilities here, they give them notice. We'll be coming in. In other words, they give them enough time to make sure everything gets done. Instead of doing a spot check right they here and now, we are at the door, let us in this minute. They would take that hospital and they would take and throw it in the garbage heap. It is so filthy. A year ago, I was here and I went over to see I didn't get an IMT for birth control, right, to the clinic. They gave me it. And I got out and did to me on a release day. And I got out a month later, I started hemorrhaging. And I'm like, wow, what it is? So I go to emergency hospital and they tell me, well, this coil was put in wrong or you've been balling too hard, one or the other. And I hadn't been doing nothing. And this is, well, then it was put in wrong. And uh, what is this? And they tell me that it had bacteria on it. And it was dirty, you know? And just, just the thought of it. And now I had, you know, I got abscessed ovaries. The whole, my whole feeling all these were just completely rushed, just uh, sick. I mean, I've been sick for a year. Okay, now it's all healed up. I don't have any more infection. All I have is big, heavy scars on my, on my inside of my uterus and my ovaries. And now I'm 24 years old and have to have a, a complete hysterectomy. Okay, well, wait a minute. We, you, we got people here from the outside, and. And you guys know from like women on the streets, there are certain things that this society teaches a woman that she is, and one of them is meek, mild, and submissive, and all that garbage. <laughs> okay, like for instance, when you're a housewife, such as I was, I never associated with other women. The men, they got together at work, and they have a more unity because they were together at work and working together. Women that never have worked together, not even as housewives, they were separated. They couldn't spend that much time together because they had their own little duties. And I think this is one of the reasons why women are so divided, because they never have worked together like men. They go out, whatever they're doing, if they're working on a construction job, they're together. They're working in a factory, they're together, you know. But we were always separated in our own little homes. You had your home, I had my home to clean, and we couldn't get that unity. My particular experience, like this is my third time back, and with, you know, until I realized all these, all these years of using, until I, I came here this time, I have never, I've never really slowed down enough to take a look and say, I've never known women, I've never known women. I've always been surrounded by men. And this trip back is, it's fantastic. You can reach out and you can touch. And what's so far out for myself is that my experience isn't unique. It isn't all by itself. Like there's just, what, 700 of them. Okay, homosexuality. It's um, enforced by the administration, or it's encouraged by the administration, yet it's against the law, literally, you know, like it's against the so-called rules here in the institution. Yet they realize that uh, if they really enforced 
those rules that everybody would really say, uh-uh, we're not going to go for this. Homosexuality is so, you know, I mean, so, so I like, it shocks. This is, um, I think this is one of the hardest things that a person has to become adjusted to is seeing women, uh, couples, you know, seeing female couples uh, lay on the grass or stand up against buildings or be um, aggressive, you know, I mean, in other words, bring this, you know, just bring their whole thing right out into uh, where everybody's at. And I think that uh, this kind of shocks a lot of people. That this, 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 I think, is the hardest adjustment to me. Now, I've, I've managed to have about 20 relationships in here in uh, almost two years. You've had a good time. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> the staff's always complimented me and the board and said that I, I do pretty well in that I don't, you know, get any write-ups or, in, or in, I'm not involved too seriously with anybody. I don't go with somebody. I don't go with anybody. I've always told other women that I'm involved with that I don't want to go with them because I, I want to go with a lot of women. <laughs> As a Madonna, I can just be the woman. Just be human. Yeah, I can be Great. human. Right, I can be human and love her. And I love it. I really love her deeply. And she, I, I'm sure she knows it, you know. And I know the right music for her, you know. I, you know, it's really me because I love it. You are alone with yourself a lot more than other women because you're locked in your cell by yourself and you can retreat into your cell, you know, by yourself. And you do have to handle everything yourself. And you have to do your own time yourself. Even in close relationships, people will always be reminding you, do your own time. You know. the types of jobs that are available on CIW for women, uh, cosmetology, manicures, uh, x-ray technician, lab technician, janitorial service, jan uh, yard work, garbage crew, kitchen workers, house, uh, hospital aides, um, maintenance. I don't really have a runner on the streets, you know, so I have to work in here for whatever they pay me. You know, it ain't much, but I mean, it, I have a bad cigarette, Jones, and I have to smoke, you know. And you'll go to the board and they'll tell you to bring them some degrees. You don't get paid for going to school. What are the wages here? No wages. None. <laughs> Seven cents an hour, ten cents an hour. Um, we pay our oppressor. You know, like we pay the wages, like with our work. With us getting up every morning and going to work, it pays those people's salary that's locking us up. These people ain't guaranteeing nobody no job when they get out of here. They say you do, they tell you to go sew your ass out there for an hour and that they'll have a job for you when uh, you get out. I haven't seen one brought up north that they found a job for. Her. My friend tells me, she says, well, go to this other place and tell them you're on call and see what happens, you know. Well, we'll call you, you know. And I knew I had the, the ability to do the job. Mm -hmm. Better than that dude did, you know. But still, no, we'll call you. And I haven't heard from him since. <laughs> I was thinking about going to school when I got out to take uh, some special courses to help handicapped children, but as it is here, this place ain't got what I need, you know. that it's 1974 out there and that women are no longer simply interested in uh, washing floors, changing diapers, smiling at patients in hospitals, working at sewing machines, or doing somebody's hair as their life's work. And this institution offers them no other alternative at all. Who wants to learn how to comb hair, you know? Uh, who wants to be a janitor when they leave here? And when I first started working with computers way back in 65, <laughs> they told me, oh, Ms. Wilson, you can't uh, work with us because you're a woman and this is a man's field. So I had this to fight uh, for the longest. part of CIW is gassy, but the mental, there are a lot of locked doors. Um, sometimes I don't expect them to be locked. 
I go to open it because I think it's open and it's locked. It's annoying because I think we'll get somebody to open it. And it's an unusual situation. It, it might seem trivial to you, but if you've lived with it for two years, it sort of gets on your nerves. They've given them TVs and eyelashes and shit like that. Now, they're doing more time, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've said it many times. Take those fucking TVs, and take TV. the makeup, take the clothes, give us yeah. back our state dress, and quit threatening us. We eat in the dining room. And I'm going to put before to a table. Okay, we may push the table together, and then here come the pigs. You know, they tell us immediately. So the same day we ate lunch, there was a group of white women that pushed their table together. And he immediately came over to our table. You know, and he wanted to get our names and numbers and institutions. So we, you know, we, we, just, we just rolled over him and told him why don't he go over to that other table. You know, he said, well, he gave us some kind of remark that, uh, I already know their names, and I know them. I say, well, uh, you know my name. I'd rather really have a dress and, and some thongs and some cell doors, cell doors clanging all the time. In the room to myself was toothpaste soap and a wash rag. And a release day. On this day, you will leave, or if you are good, we will let you go earlier. indeterminate sentence was put in as a liberal means. The whole idea behind it was so that they could judge people individually on uh, what kind of a person you were, not what your crime was. Well, what happens to anybody who comes in here with any political background at all, even a juvenile record, they're going to say, well, you're going to have to do more time because you're here um, because you finally did something criminal, but you really want the establishment to fall. Okay, and just because you were a demonstrator or because you were a member of Vince Ramos or because anything, you're going to do as long as we can give you to do because you're a bad person. Now, that's not the idea of the, of the indeterminate sense. It's a drawing of panel A, and it's... I guess a full board, there's six members, and it's the actual size of the room, although I don't have it written down, it's about 20 by 20. It's a big long table, it's really plush like a courtroom. And this is an inmate, this is a council, who acts like a secretary, the board. And they talk with you and decide upon your time or your parole, when you're eligible for parole, or set your term. The major problem with the indeterminate sentence is the fact that the, it puts all the power in the hands of the board. Yeah. And the board is neither a member of the legislature body or the judicial body. It's purely an administrative function of the institution. And the people who are on the board have no training in um, philosophy, psychology, penology, or criminology. They're just friends of Governor Regan's. absolutely no basis to understand uh, what time does to people and how people end up in jail. Like people end up here basically because they're in an economic straitjacket. That goes for any drug-related crime, robbery, anything. The only reason people generally come to prison is because they're economically tight and they turn to a criminal means to make up for it. Okay, when they get here, they don't know how long they're going to do and the bench guides turn out to be the parole board, and they don't have any conception of what people should do in order to get out. Now, they've said they've issued policy statements, and on crimes which have any violence, a lot of which carry a six-month minimum, the board has come out with a policy statement in late 1973 saying that these people will do 
three years or more for um, various crimes involving violence. Okay, now that is flat out illegal. The board legally can't say that, but they do, and they make us do the hard time behind these crimes, which have a six-month minimum, and they've just arbitrarily changed the time to a three-month minimum. They've also been able to say, you have to get a divorce before you get a parole date. When you get out, you can't see your kids, because we say so. The major thing that the board does is they've got a bunch of mad religious fanatics on the board, and they say, we're going to give you a year review, another year's time, after you've already done three or four, to meet your maker, to find God. You should go down on your knees. And, and ask the Lord for forgiveness. Now, that's absolute bullshit. What's the composition of the board? Just white. Just white? There ain't no Mexicans, there ain't no blacks, ain't no pinks, ain't no greens, ain't nothing but them whiteys up there. We can talk to you like you a dog, shit in the garbage can. There's more whites in the United States than there are black. But if you take the percentage as far as Blacks in prisons and white in prisons, I feel that the majority would be black compared to the percentage of black in California. You know, because, you know, you don't have enough money to buy, you know, for an attorney, you know, and uh, if you get a public defendant, you know, he's, he's not on his job. And, um, you know, you know, with all this grudge inside of you, you come here hating the white people. She, she told me that I was a guilt-ridden, empathetic person. I feel, you know, you know, I really don't know. You know they see me as guilt-ridden. That means something to me. Why do they see me as guilt-ridden? Well, why do they see you that way? I, well, I feel the, the system has to make guilt-ridden people in order to function. Do you think you could cope with them? I think I did for a while. Look, no, can you, not I said did you, I said can you now? Can saying, I do it right now? I don't want to. Why? <laughs> Because I like those pills right now, and I'm, I'm, I'm empty right now. Well, do you think you could get your, you say you get good feelings from drugs. Do you think you could get those good feelings from some other place? Yeah, I think I could. Like what? Have a little more faith in the Lord. Who the fuck are they to get up there and say, no, you can't go back to living uh, with this man or this woman or whoever you're living with, your husband, your wife, you know, whatever, that you can't have kids. They're, they're controlling you all the way down to telling her she needs Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, that's getting bet down to, you know, the power of that parole board. In the beginning, I used to come up to my every Sunday here when I came here. And then I realized one day that the priest is passing a list to the board who goes to church and who doesn't. No, I stopped going to church. Well, I'm an ex parolee. I've been to that place. I know what it's all about. Listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. Well, somebody please listen so I can keep some of these kids out of there. If I have to trip them on the way in. But I mean, you get the goody two shoes up there in a board. And I don't know, not necessarily this board. Any board. Board of directors, board of any, any kind of a board. The ones that are higher up, that do the hiring and the firing. They don't know what it's about. They really do not know what it's about. I'm doing five to life. You know, so if I get, I'm doing three, you know, two five to life and a five to 15, then they happen to be running together. But should I really mess up? These people have the power to keep me here for my life. You've got to worry about, is the board going to tell you to get a divorce? Is it going to tell you you've got to stay away from your kids? Some women want to marry someone, but because they haven't lived common law, when they use a little bit of morals on the street, then they can't get married while they're in the institution. Right. Or if, uh, you know, okay, like, say you want to get your kids when you get out, and they don't want you to because they feel that you aren't a proper mother, although the courts have not taken your kids away, you can't have your kids. You know, you, okay, that's some of the changes. The changes of being away from the persons that you love, only being able to see them twice a month. 
You know, this can really mess with your head. Sitting in your room wondering, waiting, you get that restless urge that you've got to move on and you can't because you've got these walls around you. Yeah. You know, those changes can really, really mess with someone. I've done two years so far, looking at five more and then getting my time. Hey, yeah, that hurts. I had a, a run in with the staff because I didn't come in with an H on my jacket and I immediately got very tight with a woman who came in with an H on an iron jacket. So um, the fact was that I had had very close relationships with three other women and that before I even got in here. So, and I enjoyed that very much and I'm still very close to all of them. So I ran into various things about, now you're, you're a heterosexual, you have a husband. And I'd say, yeah. And they said, what does he think about you're going around with this other woman. I said, he knows her and likes her. And he knows the other women that I've been with and likes them. And uh, the fellow just sort of raised his eyebrows and said, no, this is impossible. And I think maybe one of the things that prison started to do for a while was limit my conception of what's possible. You take... Uh Take a white girl married to a black dude. Ooh, they don't like that. They don't like that, and they're going to stop some time to her. So I walked back in after I got my time, and after I presented all these things that I could do on the outside, much better than in here, I said to them, what do you feel this institution has to offer me? My minimum's way overdone. What does this place have to offer me? Well, we've got college courses, and we feel you have to get in tune with yourself, and we feel that you're a guilt-ridden person, and we feel this, we feel that. And I said, I got the college courses outside. I got those organizations outside. I can take, I assume Jesus is outside. <laughs> I can take care of that guilt outside. Um, what does this place have to offer me? Well, would you like to answer that? No, you go. <laughs> and finally, one person came down and said, this is a punitive measure. Right now, that's where it's at. <laughs> and why they don't just say that, I could accept that a lot better than that other bullshit. What would do Job is training. Is making as many cases as the DA wins, he's getting another year in his position is what we're doing. Uh, you know, we're giving them DAs the publicity, we're giving the police that bust us publicity, and we're giving the judges that send us here publicity. We're letting the big crooks run for office of governor. We're letting the big crooks run for president. president. When they give you time, I don't know if they realize this. Or if they don't realize this, people do tell them, you know, don't give me time, I'll become a criminal. Don't you realize that people who adjust to prison will become criminals? And speaking honestly about myself, I'm a working person and I always have been and I enjoy doing things with my hands. But I've uh, found it to be attractive to think about getting a gun, getting a some money ripping off some rich people because of the system, because of the people I've met in here, because of uh, how really easy it does seem to be as, you know, a way of life. And it's a hard world out there in this country. What do you say, Patricia? I, um, I did have faith in myself. Something's happening to me in the last couple of months. Well, I think ever since they started this 1168, things have been falling apart underneath me. Because you yeah. know you have to go back out there and, and face all the things that you left behind. What's that what you've been able to cope with because you left them behind. But, and you didn't have to worry about them. And now that you're getting ready to go back out there and you know you're going to have to start worrying about the bills and how the money's going to get, how your kids are going to get food, how you're going to be clothed in the winter. I've had That's why people, people tell me that. I've had a few people tell me that. I, I went through and it. I was ready to go home once, but I was too afraid to go out there and try to cope with it again. Why should it be afraid? So the first thing when I went out there, the first thing I did was grab for some drugs. And I ended up getting myself a new case in another year here. here. Which isn't going to help because this year is going to come to an end too. I was brought up on welfare. I'm a state baby, honey. I wasn't just now been taking care of state. I've been take, state has been taking care of me ever since I was one day old. Like the state brings you in here and all of a sudden you're totally dependent upon the state. You know, for everything. You know, if they don't cook your meals and uh, open that door for you to eat, you'd sit in your room and wait and wait and wait, you know, uh, for food. 
like the laundry. If you don't get your laundry together, now they have it so you can take your own over there. But there was, you know, like you would sit and wait. And if they didn't do all these things for you, then, you know, you'd never, you'd never get them done. And, and I think that subconsciously that they gear your mind towards having this all the time, you know, that um, you don't have to worry about about your meals because you know someone over there is going to cook. You don't have to worry about clean sheets on your bed because you know somebody's going to wash. You don't have to worry about anything, you know. But consequently, it makes you too dependent on the state. And we feel that, you know, she's just a great big arm mother. And uh, <laughs> the, bear, the woman with the bear and the helmet. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, and there's, there's really no warmth from her. There's no sincerity. There's nothing, you know and they totally destroy a person. And since I've been here, I've written about 30 songs, and they're getting better and better. And, and I just know if I was on the streets, I would be taking drugs. You know, I hate to say that, because it's like saying, well, see, it did me, you know, it's doing some good. I hate to admit that, but it is true. But you have to go back to the streets. Yeah. What will happen then? <clears throat> I don't know. I'm afraid. I'm afraid <laughs> to tell you the truth. I am really kind of scared. Through the workshops we've come in, that have kind of given me a reason to know what's wrong. All I knew is that something was wrong, but I couldn't identify it. And getting together with them and realizing some word, some word called sisterhood, uh, uh, has helped. What they do is they give you a teetotal picture of the whole United States, of the whole fucking system, really. You know, how it is, how it affects us, the things that it does to put money in this one's pocket and consequently taking away something from me or somebody else like me, you know, or like all of us, you know. It's um, like if they build a shop and say, okay, maybe it's an area that would be a park for children, everybody's kids, you know. But now it's gone to put money in somebody else's family. All these workshops that really have influenced me. I wouldn't have thought about going to school because I'm afraid of competing with teenage boys that look like me and teachers that might not like me and feeling that I really don't belong in school. And yet all, all of the women that come in here have, maybe it's not true, but I think that, that that's where what schools like. There's a lot of those kind of people. And the men they bring in too are, are nice too. They don't seem to resent my getting an education. I'm making an appeal that I hope that whoever's watching this tape would. Um, some of the Chicano sisters out there, Chicano dudes, black dudes, black sisters, would Puerto get Rican. together. Puerto Ricans, Indians oh, would all Indians, get together. Indians, you know, any, any minority group would all get together and try at least to Jews. bring in... Jews, right. Uh, bring in uh, some uh, workshops that, that other minorities can relate to. One of the major things that's hit with everybody in here is your own conception of your self-worth, your self-respect, and your dignity. And if you're doing what you want to do and you're proud of what you're doing and of the way you move in the world, you're a headache to the administration. Mm -hmm. So sure they want to have you washing floors, right. sewing ancient shirts, you yeah. know, this kind of thing. And it's, it's to their advantage to keep us doing bullshit work. Yeah, this place is so, it's unbelievable. This place will make you a break. Yeah, that's about the size of it. Me being a, a woman, a dope thing, gay, and a minority, yeah, I, got, I know I'm going to have problems, you know? And since I couldn't cope with all of these energies inside of myself that say, look at all of this stuff and you're not doing anything, I was a junkie. Yeah. But you know, Until now when I'm realizing that, hey, I'm a strong woman. If you really come right down to it, all I think everybody in the penitentiary is, is, is a potential leader, you know, because we are in here for doing things that, that uh, yeah, or, or even if they do, it's not every woman that does it, you know. Yeah. So, but we've just been channeled in the wrong, as far as they're concerned, wrong direction, you know. But if we had applied ourselves in, in things that we could or wanted or, or can do, you know, there's no, no limit to what we could, you know. We stepped out of our places. And as soon as people start realizing that they have some value in the world, then you're going to get people to go, wait a minute, these are our legal rights. These are our human rights. And don't you yeah. fuck with either one of them. Well, women are very untogether in this prison. They are all part together, regardless of color, your religion, 
you know, fight against this system, you know, because it's fucked and we know it, we're here, you know, a lot of them are here for some humbug, you know, but they ride on over there and say, well, I want to go home. Well, they should think about the future. Well, instead of, yeah, you're going to go home sooner or later, but what about your, your son or your daughter that might be coming here? You ought to try to have some other kind of prison alternative because this is not it. They need us. They cannot run this institution without the prisoners. If we closed down for three days, don't you know they'd be running up the walls? Nobody in industry, nobody in the laundry. If the kitchen workers broke down. But you know what? The women haven't got the heart to come together and fight as a whole. Yeah, okay, now that's part that we were discussing before you got here, the indeterminate sentence and the fear that people have because people, a lot of people come in here with life talk. California's average sentence. Most people in California are doing time with life talk which gives not only the administration but the outside courts your whole life to fuck with you. And so people say, well, I'll just put my dignity in my back pocket and I'll kiss ass and maybe I'll get out of here. Right. And the problem is, right, you know, that kissing ass isn't going to get you out of here either. No. So, you know, I'm going to you know what the real thing hey, They're going to tell you you're faking it. You know what the real thing is? Hold that you want to get teased and then slack off. Yeah. Well, what the thing is, too, okay, now, if we don't cooperate, they're going to fold. But what the women don't know is that if we all come together and we fight as a whole, I mean all of us, and fight as a whole for these issues, we're going to be more free than we would be if we weren't, if we go on taking this shit. Yeah. You know, and if we do come together, they can't slough us all. They couldn't motivate or operate the institution without yeah. us. That's it. That's because I have a number behind me, and I feel that that's going to hold me back. You know, because I'm black, it's gonna hold me back. Because I'm a woman, it's gonna hold me back. You know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I have three strikes against me. You know. But um, I'm, you know, I'm gonna keep on pushing. You know, I'm not gonna let this hold me back. You know, I'm gonna go back out there. And, you know, give me an education. Three or four weeks ago, I was really into prison alternatives. I thought, wow, anything would be better than um, these bars and these fences. But the more I checked into it, okay, like I really did a lot of reading on uh, some of the programs that are in use now, and they're really nothing. I mean, it's just a continua continuation of regimentation. I was totally ignorant of politics. Uh, what the United States consists of. I was so into me, you know, in a big self-pity trip that I never really looked around to see the rest of the world, you know, and that the whole world is in the same bag that I'm in. But now I know the reasons that created it, and I can correct it. But I think the majority of the people really aren't aware of why they're doing what they're doing or why they're suffering, you know, in the way that they're suffering. And the knowledge has to be given. You know, people just have to be become more concerned with people. Maybe somebody looking at this, you know, sometimes will be able to learn that um, we're no different from them, you know, and that our problems are their problems, you know, and that any one of those people could be in my position right now. The main, the main thing is unity. I know within a prison setting, the unity is much stronger because you're all in the same spot and you know you are. When you're in the free world, it seems to be a little bit more selfish. The people just don't seem to care that much for other people, you know. And so I really wonder who's really in prison, you know. Is it really us? And uh, it all boils down to concern, you know. The whole, the whole country has to be concerned for each other. We can't place nobody above or below. You know, when you reach a hand out, you don't look at the hand first, you know, to see what kind of hand it is. You just grab a hold of it and pull them up. You have to realize that prisons exist. Uh, you have to realize that there's a lot of people out there with no education that have not had the opportunities to better themselves, that want to eat, who don't want to stand in welfare lines because that's been down for so long. You know, um, who thinks that it's a matter of pride, you know, that they can't take anything from anybody else because that's part of the bullshit that they've brainwashed into us. 
And, you know, like to have a socialist revolution, you'd have to organize, you'd have to realize that these problems exist. There are prisons, there are people who go to prison because of economic reasons, like 95%, you know, and uh, so if you want to get rid of prisons, you know, you've got to start organizing in your own communities and change a society. I wrote this song from a maximum security cell at CIW that I spent two years in. Warmer than warmest, deeper than deepest, colors of crimson, we're here in prison. Our hearts are encased in concrete bar rooms, traveling in mine ways. Our connection is you, and we're alive. I'm alive. I'm I didn't die. Yeah, what you gonna do about me, sir? What you gonna do about me? What you gonna do with someone who sees you, sir? What you gonna do about me? I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. I'm alive, I'm alive. You know, I didn't die. I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. I'm gonna cut down all your jive. I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. I'm gonna cut down all your jive. Warmer than warmest, deeper than. Colors of crimson, we're here in prison, we'll be coming from prison, we'll be coming, watch us, we'll be coming from prison.